In our lesson together last week, we studied one half of a passage from the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, Christians are encouraged to weep when others are weeping. So we spent our time together in our 11 a.m. worship last week considering the idea of weeping when others are weeping, especially when you might not feel like weeping. But let's look at the other half of that verse today. In Romans, in Romans 12, verse 15 again. To weep when others are weeping, but also to rejoice when others are rejoicing. As we go through this lesson, let's consider some things about joy and sorrow and the way they're related to each other. Let's consider why it is that Christians must rejoice when others are rejoicing and why it is that you can't minimize one side of Romans 12 verse 15 to the exclusion or the detriment of the other. It is just as important to weep with those who are weeping as it is to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And when we can look at both sides of that verse and when we can learn to practice it consistently, we will see the way that brotherly love can come to life in our congregation. I appreciate, first of all, that Paul doesn't minimize one side or the other. That when it comes to weeping with your brothers and sisters and rejoicing with your brothers and sisters, Paul doesn't say that one of them is more important than the other. Paul doesn't say, well, if you get around to the other side of it, or if it's convenient for you, or if you feel like it, or someday maybe try it. No, you have to do both of them. Because life is very complicated. Life can be very joyful at times, but life can also be very miserable. And joining with our brothers and sisters, whether it be sorrow or misery, is like a part of what makes the church such a wonderful thing. But joy is complicated. And the way that it relates to sorrow is very complicated. We often find that joy and sorrow are interwoven with each other. So rather than seeing them in a simplistic binary way, that is, you're either joyful or you're sorrowful, and you're never a combination of the two of them. They never overlap. Rather than seeing them as just purely binary emotional states where we have no control over them, we need to view them as attitudes that unexpectedly overlap in often very satisfying ways. And the Bible frequently connects them as well. Great passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, a passage that we often connect with suffering. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at the way that he says we should approach our suffering. Beginning in verse 12, for context sake, Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, he says the suffering, right? When you share in the sufferings of Christ, what should your response be? To feel really down and mopey about it? No, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing joy and sorrow intermingled together so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation verse 14 if you're reviled for the name of christ you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of god rests upon you those things are related to each other they're interwoven with each other joy and sorrow can't just be broken up into two independent things, according to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4. James makes a similar comment. Go back just a couple pages in your Bible. In James chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, he says, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. And I don't know about you, but being exalted by God sure sounds like a joyful experience to me. But he's saying, learn how to mourn and weep. Learn how to get out of your own circumstances. Learn to set aside superficial emotions and trade them for a deeply satisfying relationship to God where He dictates your mood and not just life's conditions or life's circumstances. And when you can learn to mourn and weep and set aside those sorts of things you will learn what it means to be lifted up by God. 
And being lifted up by God feels a whole lot better than watching your favorite TV show. And being lifted up by God feels a whole lot better than turning to drink. And being lifted up by God feels a whole lot better than indulgence in sexual fantasies. And being lifted up by God feels a whole lot better than any victory that your favorite sports team could win. And it lasts a lot longer as well. But even in the context of Romans 12, our original verse, Romans 12 verse 15, even in the context of that verse, Paul doesn't ignore the coexistence of suffering and joy often very closely related to each other. Take a look here at Romans 12 and see what the rest of the context has to say. In Romans 12, let's start in verse 9 and go on through verse 14. He says here, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Persevering. You have rejoicing in hope and persevering in tribulation standing right next to each other. And again, if you think of these things as purely binary, where you can either be joyful or you can be sorrowful. You can either be happy or you can be sad and you can't be them at the same time. Then how can that verse work? How can these Christian attitudes and these Christian behaviors work together in Romans 12 if it's a purely binary emotional sort of thing? Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. Which is harder to you? When you read Romans 12 verse 15, which side of that verse is more difficult for you? At first you might think, well, the weeping is harder. Isn't it always harder to weep? Weeping when others are weeping sounds very difficult to me. But I don't know if that's the hardest part of that verse. Because I feel like when you can weep when others are weeping and kind of share in their sorrow, but you know that at the end of it you get to go home and you still have a happy marriage and you're still healthy and your house is not burnt down and you have a job to go to the next day. I kind of feel like it's easier to weep when others are weeping when you can finish the weeping, comfort them and sympathize, and then you get to go home and kind of life goes on and life is normal for you. I feel like rejoicing when others are rejoicing is actually the harder part of that verse. You don't think at first it would be, but I think that's the harder part of that verse. Because when you're having fertility problems... I think a baby shower might be just about the hardest thing to go to. And when your marriage is on the rocks and you're really struggling and you guys have been going through counseling and things don't seem to be getting any better, getting an invitation to somebody else's wedding, it's a very uncomfortable thing to go through. And when you're the one facing the health difficulty, but you find out somebody at church is going to pull through and they're going to be okay... I think it's really hard to get out of your own circumstances and rejoice when others are rejoicing. Because your suffering gets to go on. Because you got to get up the next day and you're still battling. Yeah, at first weeping sounds like the harder part, but I really think in practice rejoicing when others are rejoicing, that's the more challenging side of that verse. So what are a few things that we learn about rejoicing when others are rejoicing. What is the value of walking out of your own circumstances and joining in somebody else's? What is the value of feeling joy for somebody else when joy is the last thing on your mind? Well, the first lesson is this. Because rejoicing with others is inherently other-focused. It is inherently other-focused. I'm certainly not saying it's easy for me to get out of my own emotional state and and share in somebody else's joy, but even accepting the challenge itself represents a very unselfish step. Even just being willing to say congratulations when you really don't feel like saying it. Even just being willing to say, your situation is such a blessing. What a blessing for you to be going through this, this really tremendous opportunity. I think that represents unselfishness. This is great news. This is really great news for you. 
Now, you don't have to lie to people. Don't say, I'm happy. Because if you're not, if, you know, if they got the job that you wished you'd get, if they're in a circumstance where they're feeling all that joy and, and you wish that you were in that same circumstance, you don't have to lie and pretend that you're happy about everything. But you can tell people congratulations for it. And you can acknowledge that it's a blessing. And you can acknowledge that they have been incredibly blessed by God. And this is great news for you. And even if you just don't feel emotionally very happy, just accepting the challenge, I think, is one really big step in the right direction for us. Because what it's saying is that I'm accepting a lesser role. In our relationship, I am accepting a lesser role, and I'm going to uplift you right now. And I'm going to rejoice with you, even though I don't feel like it. And I'm going to acknowledge that you're in a really good place right now. And you're smiling, and you're laughing. I'm going to accept that lesser role. I'm going to move myself out of the spotlight. I'm going to consciously, if uncomfortably, direct the focus toward other people and not myself. Rejoicing with others is inherently other focused. Now, John the Baptist had a similar experience. In John chapter 3, let's notice a story here. In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. Now, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. Now, John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. There arose, therefore, a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. Verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have borne witness, behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. Now John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And in verse 20, 29, look at, Look at John's overall assessment of his place in relation to Jesus, his, his condition, the state of his ministry, if you will. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. In a way, maybe John could make that old saying of, Never a bride, always a bridesmaid. Of course, within the context of the groom and the groomsmen, of course. But you know the old saying, don't you? Yeah, I've heard. I heard that Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more people than me. I, I, I've heard the news. I'm in the know. But you know this shouldn't surprise me. You heard me bearing witness that I am not the Christ. You heard me bearing witness that he's going to come later on. You knew that about me, and I told you that in advance. I'm not surprised by this. In fact, in the same way that a best man at a wedding is happy to see the groom get married, to start a new life with his bride, in the same way that he's happy to take a secondary role in that relationship, to prop up the groom... And to say, this is your day. This is your time. The spotlight's on you. Now have a great life together. That's the way I feel right now about Jesus and His disciples. I must decrease. And He must increase. And it's all to His glory. And I'm okay with that. How many of us have accepted that role as graciously as John the Baptist did? Not me. <laughs> I, I'm definitely not as good at this as John the Baptist is. And I'm an attention-hogging preacher. John joyfully accepted this role, though, even though it was a secondary role. Now, maybe did his ego take a hit? Maybe. Would my ego have taken a hit? Yes. In a similar circumstance, how would you feel about somebody else stealing your thunder, stealing the spotlight. Somebody else, somebody else enjoying the blessing that has always been just out of, out of reach for you. Somebody, somebody who's in that next phase of life. Is that an easy role to accept? And the reason why this is so difficult 
is because our own circumstances naturally occupy the center of our world. My trauma, my grief, my loss, my disappointment is always more easily felt than somebody else's joy. Let me give you a silly analogy to explain this. Let's say you're walking down the sidewalk, okay? And you're with your best friend. And your best friend just got himself an ice cream cone. And it's like the good kind, you know? Like, like the, the good kind, the real cream. And, and, a, and a handmade waffle cone, you know? You know the smell of the waffle cone cooking? Like that's what draws you into an ice cream parlor is the waffle cone, right? And he's just, he's, he's going down the street or the sidewalk, going to town on an ice cream cone. And he's making all the yummy noises and everything, okay? Now that's awesome, great. He's enjoying his ice cream cone. And as you're walking down the sidewalk, suddenly you stub your toe really bad. Which of those emotions do you feel more acutely? The joy he's experiencing with his ice cream cone or the pain that you feel from stubbing your toe really hard? Which do you feel more acutely? Which do you feel more tangibly? Which one of those things occupies your mind and your attention more than the other? Well, obviously, it's your own. So I'll say it again. My trauma is always felt more deeply by me than your joy. It is always more occupying, more distracting, and more deeply felt than your joy. So it takes incredible unselfishness for me to take my pain, put it over here for now, put my arm around you and say, congratulations. This is a great day for you. What a great day for you. A second point. Rejoicing with others who rejoice is a reminder that there are still good things on earth. Even if I am not personally experiencing them, it is a reminder that there are still good things on earth. We need to be reminded of those things because I'll tell you what. The world is, is never as bad as you think it is on your worst day. And the world's never as good as you think it is on your best day. Right? The world's never as bad as you think it is on your worst day, but it's never really as bad as you think it is on your best day. The world's kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Reality, real life is kind of somewhere in the middle. This is not heaven on earth, but it still isn't hell yet. And we need to be reminded that even though there are a lot of bad things on earth and there is a lot of tragedy and there is a lot of heartache, that's not all that there is. We need to be reminded of the good things. Otherwise, this life would be unbearable. I shudder to bring up specific examples because I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. But I think we can all think back on times where we saw something that we could never unsee. We witnessed something that left us a little traumatized. And oftentimes the only cure for that is to go home and enjoy the blessings that you still have. You know, whenever I see a pet dead on the side of the road, that really brings me down. I don't know what it is. There's, there's a lot of bad news in the world. And when you read the news, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. But there's something like so simplistically sad about a pet on the side of the road that's been hit. And I think the only cure for that, at least long term, is to go home and pet good old Howard on the head and give him a squeeze. We need to be reminded that this world is not all bad. And that for all the trauma that's there, you know, there's some nice things there too. There's still good things to enjoy. My immediate pain is only one small part of the often beautiful, often tragic, often complicated mosaic of human existence. And I think this is why Paul could still rejoice from a prison cell in Philippians 2 verses 1 and 2. That's why I think he could write the entire book of Philippians. It's a very happy book. 
Philippians is, is one of the only epistles that Paul wrote where he has nothing bad to say about that church. It's all good. I love you guys. You're in my prayers all the time. I'm rejoicing. I'm exulting. I'm glorifying God. Keep up the good work. He has nothing bad to say about it. It is a very happy book. Until you start kind of peeling the layers away and you go, this is a really happy book, but Paul wrote it in a prison cell. This is a really happy book where it concludes in chapter 4 with Paul saying, I've learned to be content when I have plenty, but I also had to learn to be content when I had nothing. Both of those two things happened to Paul at some point. It's the reason why he could write Romans chapter 5, which we read earlier in our worship service for our scripture reading in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We exult in our tribulation. We rejoice in our tribulation. What? How can you rejoice in tribulation? Because tribulation is just one small part of the totality of who you are and your life's experiences and what you're going to be for all eternity. And so you can rejoice in your tribulation. Yes, you can rejoice. It's why Paul could write in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Notice here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. It's why Paul could write here to the Corinthians, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. An abundance of joy and deep poverty standing side by side. So for as bad as this world is, remember, there are still good things. And when when your life is occupied, and there's nothing wrong with it being occupied by tragedy, but when your life is occupied, make sure there's somewhere to go afterwards. Make sure that, you're, that you're, your sorrow is moving a certain direction. I think the joy on the horizon, other people's joy, is kind of that reminder, that, that motivator that says, things look rough right now, but don't forget, maybe you're struggling in some area of life, but this family over here, they're doing really well. And that's a good thing. And there's still children out there laughing in playgrounds. And there's still kittens chasing after butterflies. And there's still plenty of roses out there to smell. And there's plenty of sunrises and sunsets left to see. And steak is still steak and football is still football. There's still a lot of good things left on earth. Let's not forget that. But a third point is this. When I learn to rejoice with others who are rejoicing, I remember that joy is not a zero-sum game. Now, zero-sum game is a term that's sometimes used in economics. It's also used in gambling. I'm not a gambler. Don't worry. I don't have a problem. But a a zero-sum game, and the the simplest zero-sum game is this. If I have a penny and you have a penny, and we both flip the coin, if both pennies end up facing the same way, I win both pennies. If the pennies end up facing different ways, one is heads and one is tails, you win the pennies. A zero-sum game is the only way I can win is by your loss. The only way you can win is by by my loss. Joy is not a zero-sum game. The fact that other people are doing really well in certain areas of life, in their relationships or their family or their finances does not mean you've been deprived of something because of their joy. And I think we we make a mistake. And it's envy creeping in, by the way. It's envy creeping in. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking that, well, he got the job and I didn't. But you work for different companies. Well, they're, they're doing really well in their family life, but we're not. But that has nothing to do with you. How come, how come everybody else's marriage is going so well, but mine is on the rocks? That has nothing to do with you. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not like there's a limited number of... There's not like a limited number of things on earth that are joyful, and if you miss out on one, you don't get anything else. I'll give you some examples, by the way, some kind of practical things. Weight loss or fitness success. Because somebody else ran their first marathon, it's not like you can go like, well, rats, I guess I can't do that now. 
Because somebody else lost 30 pounds, that's not 30 pounds that you're not allowed to lose anymore. So it's things like weight loss and fitness success. You can rejoice with others who are rejoicing because you didn't lose anything by their joyful experience or their success. Enjoying or mastering an art form or a hobby. Most types of relationships. I know you could come up with some silly hypothetical that say, uh, well, we both like the same girl and she ended up picking him instead of me. I I know you could come up with silly hypotheticals, but the fact is that God works in wonderful and mysterious ways and maybe you wouldn't have liked being married to her anyway. (laughs) But a victory over sin also. You know, your, your growing strength over sin doesn't deprive somebody else of an ability to grow and mature and overcome sin. Your wisdom, there's there's not a limited amount of wisdom to go around. Like wisdom is not a commodity that's like exhaustible. Just because somebody else is learning and maturing, that doesn't deprive you. Valuable personal experiences or taking in sights or life-changing cultural experiences. You know, These are not exhaustible commodities. It's not a zero-sum game with this. And most of all, most especially salvation. You know why I can rejoice with those who are rejoicing, especially when it comes to salvation? Because there's always going to be opportunity. And it's always going to be there. The invitation is for everybody. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Not first come, first serve. All of you. Jesus' family is open-ended in Matthew chapter 12. Look around. It's people who obey me. It's people who follow me. It's people who do the will of my Father. That's my mother. That's my sister. That's my brother. People who are doing the will of the Father. And that's everybody, anybody who comes and does the will of the Father. But there's also a warning built into a parable in Matthew chapter 20. I know we're running out of time here. And in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 6... There's a man who owns a vineyard and he goes out to hire laborers for the day. And at the beginning of the day, he hires a few laborers and he says, well, I'll pay you a certain wage. Come out and do some work for a day. And they, they're happy to take the wage. It's a fair day's wage that they're offered. And they go and they work. So an hour later, he goes out to try and find more workers. He says, well, I'll give you the same wage. Come on, do some work. And an hour later, he finds a few more workers. And at the end of the day, at the 11th hour of the day, the last hour, he finds a few people still kind of hanging out there waiting to work. He says, well, I'll tell you what, come and work. Now, at the end of it all, and he's starting to dole out the day's wages, the people who'd been there since the beginning thought, you know, he's going to pay us extra. Because we've been here all day. Maybe he'll pay us even more because we were here from the beginning. And guess what? At the end of the day, everybody got a denarius. Everybody got a day's wage from the people that worked all day to the people that worked just for the last hour. And the people that worked all day got all grumbly. and They got all bent out of shape because they said, those people have been working for an hour and they got paid the same as us. Watch out for envy. Watch out for envy. Oh, that's the greatest challenge to rejoicing with others who are rejoicing. The comparison that we offer. The excuses that we offer. Being jealous of somebody else's success. Watch out for envy. Watch out for cynicism. Joy is a foretaste of heaven, my friends. It is often very elusive here on earth. But it reaches incomprehensible levels in God's presence in the afterlife. We sow in tears here on earth. It is what it is. But when you sow in tears, or when you sow in tears, you reap in rejoicing. In John chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus said, in this life you have suffering. There's many tribulations in this life. It, it just, it's a fact of life. It is what it is. In this life, there's a lot of suffering. But remember, this life doesn't last forever. So take the joy, even if it's not your joy, even if it's somebody else's new baby, somebody else's marriage, somebody else's success, Somebody else's growth and maturity, spiritually speaking. 
somebody else's success in defeating sin. Right? Take, take somebody else's joy and remember that that joy, even in the smallest measure, is a foretaste, a zenith of joy in heaven. Because in heaven there will be no sin, so no temptation. In heaven there will be no disappointment. We're not going to get to heaven and go, I kind of thought it would be bigger. In heaven there will be no tears and no sorrow and no grief because all the first things have passed away. And for however small it might seem, as hard as it is to accept, when you can learn to rejoice with others who are rejoicing, as uncomfortable or as inconvenient as it might be, what you're doing is you're getting a little hole a little view, a little preview of our glory in heaven. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. Because all the blessings that we talked about, these are blessings that are only found in life in the kingdom. And if you're not part of the kingdom, it's time to listen to the message of the gospel and make a change. Put very simply in Mark 16, 16, and there's plenty more we could study together, but Jesus puts it so succinctly He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's an invitation for all people for all time. If you only listen, you only do it.